this is the last talk and the most important talk of the whole uh, two days. We'll go to the incidental findings. Often when you do hybrid imaging, whether it's a spec CT or PET CT, we look for incidental findings. Then the clinical question is whether to report or not. In the past, people used to get away saying that we do a non-diagnostic CT or a low-dose CT. Therefore, you know, it's not interpretable. But I think uh, even in a low-dose CT, if you see an abnormality, uh, legally you are uh, required to report, especially if you're seeing a large aortic aneurysm and you are supposed to report all those things. So therefore, picking up incidental findings is important, especially even if you do a bone scan uh, for a bone spec CT, whether it's for an orthopedic indication, uh, it is a rule that you need to look at all the uh, soft tissue and all the windows within the region of interest for other uh, non on I mean, uh, bony pathologies. So when you do a spec CT, it means you have to look at the entire spectrum not only related to the particular organ in a particular window. Incidental findings uh, are often seen and it's often unrelated to the clinical question asked. Therefore, sometimes incidental findings may alter patient management. Frequency of inc incidental findings and their significance is unknown because uh, often they pick up quite a lot of findings, but that it's clinically relevant. Uh, that has is quite debatable as to which findings need to be documented and which should be reported. Adequate training to recognize normal patterns and variants is important, uh, which I think I will cover most of it, but in tomorrow we'll uh, go in detail exactly like if you see a lung nodule, we will uh, explain to you how the, uh, the lung nodule has to be followed up by specific criteria that uh, we have planned it for tomorrow. And also the challenges is because we do an unenhanced or a non-contrast CTs and low-dose CTs, and it is challenging to uh, recognize this confidently and to report. So these are the limitations we often find. Current evidence is more into uh, PET CT. And in fact, uh, the paper from MD Anderson, they looked at 321 patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer. 82% of the patients had incidental abnormalities on the CT out of their 329. And 24% were outside the range of standard thoracic uh, staging. And but when they come to overall, only 4% of those 82% were of major clinical significance. So, and there's another paper which looked at 250 patients, clinically significant, confined to CT, were relatively infrequent, but only 3% uh, of the incidental findings they picked up was clinically relevant. But we classified uh, generally, like uh, we wrote a review paper classifying uh, the incidental findings. We divided them into major finding. If it's a major finding, it means uh, one has to likely have clinical impact that should be reported immediately to the referring clinician. If it's a moderate finding, it may require further investigation, but the health outcome is variable. So it may be useful or it may not be useful. It's up to the clinician to decide how relevant it is due to the pathology. Minor incidental finding uh, rarely requires further assessment, but whenever you see it, it's also useful to mention it so that if there is in future that changes into something else, at least uh, we are covered saying that we recognized it, we mentioned it. It depends again on the clinician whether to act or not. In lung and chest, uh, you need to look for lung nodules, consolidation, interstitial lung disease, whether the, the patient has got previous uh, tuberculosis, pleural effusion, pleural thickening, and pneumothorax. So how do you classify them into severe, moderate, and mild? Well, if it's a major finding, if it's a lung mass, it should be documented and reported. If it's a large pleural effusion, if you detect lymphangitis, carcinomatosis, malignant pleural thickening, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, all this has to be converted to the referring clinician ASAP means immediately. As soon as you find when you're reporting the scan, all you have to do is to pick up the phone and inform the clinician. Moderate, if it's an indeterminate lung nodule, like how often you have to follow up and how do you uh, look after that? Consolidation, interstitial lung disease, emphysema, and bronchitis we see quite frequently. You know, in in fact, every patient has got some uh, emphysematous changes. If they are smokers or if they're elderly, you see that quite regularly. Whether to document that or not, it is variable. But if it's a calcified nodule, if you see in a bone window and you can see the nodule calcified, it's likely to be a granular mattress disease, and that uh, less likely to have any clinical significance. Pleural plaques again. In the era of asbestosis, the patients will have lived, so most of them will have some uh, pleural blocks. Uh, this is how the lung metastasis, pulmonary nodules are the most common manifestations of secondary neoplastic disease in the lungs. The nodules can be single, it can be multiple, it can be spherical, or it can be variably sized. So you have to just look for it, and if it is not there, then you don't have to report it. 
Pleural effusion, again, if it is a small or a moderate size, uh, we often don't uh, uh, take it as an emergency finding. But if it's a large pleural effusion, or even if it is a moderate side pleural effusion, if the patient is symptomatic, uh, the first question you have to ask him whether the uh, symptoms have been increasing over a period of time. But he says that he had a recent uh, biopsy and he feels the same for the last 15 to 16 days, then it's not going to be a, that much of a significance. But if he's dyspneic at the time of whether you're doing a PET scan or a spec CT scan, it is always better to inform the uh, clinician. Small pericardial effusion with uh, breast implants, that's pericardial effusion, this is a breast implant, collection of fluid in a pericardial space, only large collections, it will have a problem if it's a smaller one, it's better to mention, but it may not have any uh, clinical relevance. Plural calcification, that's what you see, and when you see it, it's better to document and report it. So unless you look for all these conditions, you're not going to find them. So if you're going to look only for a specific pathology, if it's a bone, you're going to look just in the bone window and diagnose, uh, you may miss all these findings. Coming to the mediastinum, you need to look for lymph nodes, whether the patient's got an enlarged uh, thyroid, dilated esophagus, whether it's got an esophageal mass. Aortic aneurysm is the most uh, commonest, and you need to document it cardiomegaly or whether the patient's got pericardial effusion again. Major finding, if it is a thoracic aortic aneurysm, is based on size. If it is more than 5 centimeter, right, you have to report aortic aneurysm. It's again, you have to classify them into mild, moderate, and severe, right? And if it's an esophageal mass, if it's a large pericardial effusion, if it's a major finding, you need to inform the clinical uh, team that there is a problem which has to be sorted before they try to manage. But in terms of thyroid goiter, you can call it as, uh, uh, you can mention it in your report, but if it's causing any pressure symptoms or if there is any uh, mediastinal extension and other things, it's better to mention all those things which may have problems during uh, surgery. Aortic aneurysm uh, is localized dilatation of aorta caused by the disease. This is often we find it and uh, now we have to call this calcification will also be seen. But when you see it, you have to call the uh, surgeon immediately and tell them. But uh, it depends on how large it is. But it's also useful to mention, if at all, you need to, to see the aneurysms like that. There is a size. Uh, So, if it's more than five centimeters, hepatobiliary and GIT, you need to look for uh, liver lesions, gallstones, wall thickening, inguinal hernia, and ascites. You can find all these things. If it's a major finding, if you find a large mass, if you find a solid pancreatic mass, a gallbladder mass or a significant biliary duct dilatation, it's a major finding, so it may have some treatment implications. But gallstones, air in the biliary tract, pancreatic sex, we, especially the gallstones, we see it quite uh, frequently. All you have to do is to just mention it, but it's up to, again, the clinicians whether to act on it or they know already because all these patients would have had a multiple CTs in the past or any other investigations, they might know about the findings. But when you, you are reporting the scan for the first time, whatever the findings you see on the scan should be documented in the report. Uh, this is an example of an adrenal mass located in the perirenal space near the upper pole of the kidneys. You have to look for them, whether it's enlarged. In the PET scan, we often look whether it's growing some increased uptake, whether it's focal or it's diffuse. And uh, they may be Y-shaped or V-shaped. So it may include adenomas. It may include metastasis, especially when you are uh, doing a PET CT scan for patients with lung cancer. Uh, it is important to look at the adrenal glands because that's one of the common sites for metastasis. The abdomen, again, you have to can look, but the only thing is all these are uh, nice to tell, but in an unenhanced CT, it's quite challenging unless you really look for it. Uh, in the lungs, it is quite easy, but in other areas within the abdomen and the pelvis, it's quite challenging on an unenhanced CT. So you need to look for gastric mass and undescended testes, acute bowel obstruction. All these uh, findings is based on the PET CT data. It's not on the spec CT. So you need to look for that. And ascites will be quite easy to look at. Diverticulosis, again, it is more common you see on the PET CT scans in the PET uh, rather than on the nucleomedicine techniques. 
So this is a classical example of a gallstones and also you see some atrophic kidneys on the left side, right side and there is a bulk of gallstones. Pathological fluid collection within the abdomen, this is extensive, patients got extensive ascites and if this is the case you need to inform the clinical team or if the patient has got such a huge ascites the clinical team will know the patient has got ascites. Genitive urinary system, you need to look for renal cyst, renal calculi, atrophic kidney and hydronephrosis, we see them frequently and if it is a renal mass, yes, you need to report it. If the bilateral small kidneys, they will always know about it if the patient is uh, elderly or has got a renal failure or if there is a significant hydronephrosis, if it is a problem to the drainage, it is better to inform and if it is an adrenal mass, yes, you need to inform them to have further investigations. This is an example of a renal cyst. And they can be round in shape or oval in shape or unilocular and their density if you do the uh, Hounsfield units it should be equal to the density of water. Musculoskeletal you need to look for any incidental fractures or uh, facet joint disease or past defects, osteochondral defects or spinal canal narrowing and if it is major is paravertebral abscess, if it is a metastasis or an incidental finding if the patient comes for a benign pathology you pick up a bone metastasis, yeah, it has a major finding and in patients uh, especially with radioiodine and other things if you see uh, called compression post therapy all these things has to be reported to the uh, clinical team. Vascular as I said aortic aneurysm is most uh, important and you need to uh, inform the clinical team. Spleen if it is a massive splenomegaly you, you can call it based on that if it is splenic calcification it is of uncertain significance they do not usually mention but it depends like in the early phase of your reporting you may call all these things but over experience over 5 to 6 years you will build up your own confidence level which to call and which not to call and therefore you can skip whatever is uh, irrelevant. And in the pelvis uh, if it is an ovarian cyst more than 5 centimeter in a post lumen you have to mention it and of course if it is a uh, if they have fibroids and other things nutrient mass you can always mention it, but most of them would have had problem and they would have run ultrasound and other investigations before. Vascular calcifications, you often see that, um, but it is of uncertain significance. So, but if you see them as a patient has got other uh, problems in terms of uh, cardiac events or claudication of mortality, this may have an impact when you see them, they can have further investigations. So, after that, we will go to the Artifacts which we see is a movement artifact. I will not, uh, we'll talk about the artifacts tomorrow. So, including, so it's important that uh, you have a approach of how to uh, detect the incidental findings, which I'll come in the next part of my talk where I'm going to talk about how to report a spec CT. But it's uh, vital to recognize them and deal with them in a timely fashion. Coming to how do you deliver the spec CT service? The commonest is problem is booking. When you're going to book a patient, you need to check the referral, discuss with the clinician what exact which part of the body he wants to have a spec CT, and adequate clinical information that will have a maximum effect on your outcome of your diagnosis. You are if not have much problem in terms of uh, description, in terms of interpretation, you need to have a quite adequate clinical information. You have to justify because you can't do spec CT in all the patients. And it's a mandatory to look at all the previous uh, nuclear and non-nuclear imaging. Everybody should you should make it as a habitual. Unless you do it as a habit, uh, you're not going to do that. Whether they get uh, requested as a straightforward bone scan with plus or minus spec CT, but for orthopedic indications, you can have a local protocol modified saying that all patients uh, with orthopedic problems they can have a two-phase bone scan followed by spec CT as a routine. Preparation, you have to optimize the protocol and the technique, injected activity and uh, you, you need to plan because if it is a busy department with one or two cameras and uh, if you want to fix too many patients there, then it becomes challenging and how many spec CTs can you do uh, uh, per day. And checking the scans, you need to check the patient positioning, patient comfort, you can modify the protocol according to the patient's comfort and protocols for imaging, reconstruction and uh, you can do a whole body bone scan and proceed to spec CT if it is indicated. So that uh, amount of leverage you need to have in daily booking that if the patient has got an oncology patient it should be a plus or minus spec CT. So you should give at least 15-20 minutes extra time in booking so that if the patient is going to have a potential spec CT you can have it right away. 
reporting uh, well in processing and take selected prints for the clinicians again it varies between the type of scan you do and uh, and the orthopedician also you need to have an archive and it's also good if it is an outside hospital it's better to give a cd for the review otherwise uh, you are not marketing your spec ct service quite adequately because if it is the same hospital it is fine even then the orthopod uh, wants some specific cuts and specific images so therefore you need to ask them what images they want and deliver what they want that's the most important indication for the spec ct if you provide what they are asking for then the number of scans which you do in a department will increase and you should ask them what images to send and it's better to check the images for registration labeling and all other things before it is sent to pax efficient pathways again uh, you can avoid because some people tell you got to do two phase bone scan when you do two phase bone scan for example of an ankle we do ant post and the laterals but because we do spec ct we can avoid the lateral portions and the local views and also you can do on a specific area and skip the whole body bone scan it's up to the individual protocol but we we still do whole body bone scan on all patients even with orthopedic problem then directly go for the spec ct or if you have a uh, uh, gamma camera and a spec ct you can keep a spec ct camera dedicated only for spec ct procedures so you can do all your routine scan in your conventional gamma cameras so all patients who are potential spec ct they can have a spec ct in another camera so general studies can have a general camera you can have the dedicated spec ct only for spec ct part of the study therefore you you can do more spec ct scans a day rather than doing only 3 or 4 a day so you, you can do all the whole body scans in a separate gamma camera so if they have a potential spec ct they should go to the spec ct room and have the spec ct scan and therefore you can do more spec ct scans that is the radiation effective dose that's what most of us are worried and that's what they get if it is in the extremity like the hands and foot they get less than 1 millisievert but if you are doing for an oncological indications for chest abdomen and pelvis they get approximately 5 uh, millisievert per 40 centimeter because the field of view is 40 centimeters so per uh, bed position they get 5 millisievert coming to uh, reporting this is the most important thing because once you follow a routine if you have a diagnostic sheet or an reporting pattern you will not miss anything because if you have a particular style you need to have consistency because if you are following a specific method from top to bottom then it is less chance that you are going to miss anything helps retrospective analysis of the findings allows a granular approach but the most important thing is to look for the previous investigations you need to look for the previous investigations because half the information you already will get if the patient has already had a, a diagnostic ct or an mr foundation of the report as i said before it remains the history history and history you have a good history you get a good report and that's what you should talk to your clinician about compare across modalities you have to compare the previous scans because most of them especially with orthopedic problems they would have had a series of x-ray a series of cts on mris so when you look at all these images you know, most of the time at least half the time you will get the diagnosis from the previous reports and also it is easier to look at the specific areas based on the previous reports otherwise you will be looking at the non specific areas and you need to understand the region specific pathology and you need to look at the whole body and static images first that's how we do it when we report the scans and then we comment on any previous uh, images related to the whole body and planar and then we have a separate column or the uh, paragraph for spec ct findings and a third one will be any additional or incidental findings we find on the spec ct and then overall clinical interpretation when you do a overall clinical interpretation you have to answer the clinician's question if he is asking whether it is union or non union the first point to be answering the clinician the rest is the story you can say you know this could be that and this could be that and it's it, it, it's again the same thing when you are reporting a bone scan if the clinical question is is there is metastasis your question should be there is no evidence of metastasis but there are some degenerative changes that should be the secondary point but a majority of the royal college recommendation is you get 5 out of 5 only when you answer the clinician's question otherwise it goes to 4 and 3 comment uh, when you are reporting especially orthopedic study you need to look at the bone density which we'll uh, talk in detail tomorrow because we're going to put up individual scans and we're going to talk about the report and riz is going to talk about the anatomical aspect related to the particular area so we go case by case tomorrow uh, joint by joint 
And uh, when you're reporting, especially this is one of the examples, you need to look at the ankle mortis, then go to the subtalar joint, intertarsal, tarsal metatarsal, and metatarsal phalangeal. So you start here, go from here, you're not going to miss any findings. But if it happens that, what happens is you may pick up one or two findings here, but they may miss additional findings. You may think about it, you may structure it, but when you start dictating it, you may miss one or two points here and there. So if you go logically from top to bottom, it's unlikely that you're going to miss any uh, lesions. So somebody was asking where to look at all these teaching files. It's uh, not spec CT files, it's all radiology. There is extensive study material in Radiopedia, radiology, radiology assistant, all these are uh, free teaching materials. Extensive teaching materials, up to 3,000, 4,000 cases they have. Uh, specific cases, so if you want to know about osteoid osteoma, just go to the website, put up osteoid osteoma, you get uh, all radiological imaging bits. And in fact, for the nuclear medicine, I think so the IAEA has got very good uh, teaching files, both in conventional nuclear medicine and PET-CT, and they're trying to develop uh, the spec CT files also. This is e-anatomy is initially free, I think so, but if you want to go more extensive, they charge for the package. But the first uh, four are free, free packages. It's available freely on the internet. You can uh, easily access. And, uh, sorry? Yeah, okay. Yeah, amazing, amazing, a huge collection. And finally, the only report in the truth that matters. So whatever you say, whatever you see, you can say, but uh, by not to make, uh, tell the false things, better to tell the truth, which really matters.